Top U.S. military officials are testifying in Congress for the first time since the U.S. ended the two-decade war in Afghanistan. Natalie Brand recaps from Capitol Hill. Lawmakers across both sides of the aisle have the same question for top U.S. military leaders regarding the final weeks in Afghanistan and Kabul's fall to the Taliban. What did we miss? We absolutely missed the rapid 11-day collapse of the Afghan military, and many units did fight uh, at the very end, but the vast majority put their weapons down and melted away. The Pentagon leaders defended the decision to leave at the end of August, saying staying longer would have put U.S. personnel at greater risk. Staying at Bagram, even for counterterrorism purposes, meant staying at war in Afghanistan. But Generals Mark Milley and Frank McKenzie testified they advised both former President Trump and President Biden that the military should have kept a presence on the ground. And my view is that 2,500 was an appropriate number to remain. So I would advise any leader, uh, don't put dates certain on end dates. Make things conditions-based. While the military mission in Afghanistan is over, defense officials testify the threat of terrorism coming from the country remains a concern. A reconstituted al-Qaeda or ISIS with aspirations to attack the United States is a very real possibility. As defense officials look to the future, they acknowledge reflection is needed as well. We helped build a state, Mr. Chairman, but we could not forge a nation. Secretary Austin says the strategy of the 20-year war will need to be reviewed. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Let's talk a little bit more about this with CBS News national security correspondent David Martin, who joins us now from the Pentagon. David, six-hour hearing, a lot of ground covered, a lot of ways we could go with this. But let's start with yeah. this. In his opening statement, General Milley shed light on those calls to his Chinese counterpart that have led some to suggest insubordination in the waning days of the Trump administration. Here's some of what he said. I am certain that President Trump did not intend to attack the Chinese. And it is my directed responsibility, and it was my directed responsibility by the secretary to convey that intent to the Chinese. My task at that time was to de-escalate. My message again was consistent. Stay calm, steady, and de-escalate. We are not going to attack you. On 8 January, Speaker of the House Pelosi called me to inquire about the president's ability to launch nuclear weapons. I sought to assure her that nuclear launch is governed by a very specific and deliberate process. She was concerned and made, very, or made various personal references characterizing the president. I explained to her that the president is the sole nuclear launch authority and he doesn't launch them alone and that I am not qualified to determine the mental health of the president of the United States. Some incredible things that had to be said out loud today by the chairman. He'd hinted to reporters, David, in recent days that he wanted to explain things to lawmakers. And it's a pretty frequent and important part of his job to be talking to global military leaders, right? Right. The um, suggestion here, though, was, A, that it was, uh, I think, what was described as a secret back-channel communication, suggesting no one else uh, knew about it. And he uh, was at pains to uh, point out today that other people were on the call and still more people knew he was making the call. And he, uh, he informed uh, the White House, uh, the chief of staff of the White House, the secretary of state, after uh, one of the calls. So he wanted to dispel this idea that he was uh, secretly uh, going behind the, uh, the commander in chief's back. Uh, to uh, tell the Chinese uh, that the U.S. had no in intention of attacking. Um, he, he basically said, look, I don't know where you got this idea, because there was intelligence that uh, the Chinese were worried about an attack, an intelligence that apparently was based in part on the Chinese perception of what uh, President Trump was saying. And so what he was saying in these phone calls is, look, I don't know where you got this idea the, that uh, we're going to attack you, but we're not. And as uh, evidence that he was not being insubordinate to the commander-in-chief by saying that, he said, and look, I knew 
uh, I knew that President Trump had no plans to uh, strike China. So all I was doing was uh, telling uh, China the state of play within, within the U.S. government, and I was doing it with the knowledge of uh, other senior U.S. officials. The conversation with uh, Nancy Pelosi is a, a slightly different matter, because that involves uh, nuclear weapons. Right. Um, the, <clears throat> the president is the only person uh, who has the authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. But, as Milley said, he doesn't have the power to do it all by himself. He can't just push a button. There's an extensive authentication procedure that has to be gone through, and the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is in the middle of that procedure. And so he was—that's he, what he was telling uh, Nancy Pelosi, I'm in the middle of this. Uh, I can make sure that uh, nothing accidental happens here. Now, the general also testified that he'd spoken with several other reporters from The Washington Post and The Wall Street Journal on background, meaning they could quote what he was telling them but couldn't use his name, for a number of recent tell-all books about the end of the Trump presidency, the beginning of the Biden presidency. He pointed out he's read none of the books. How is his participation in the reporting of these books and the publication of them being received there at the Pentagon? Well, to begin with, those books add detail to an atmosphere which pervaded the Pentagon throughout the second half of 2020, that President Trump was trying to use the military for his own political purposes. So all of those anecdotes in the book uh, ring absolutely true. I think the unease uh, about those books here in the Pentagon is that Milley, by talking to the reporters and giving them all that inside uh, detail, has put himself in the middle of a political controversy. And uh, Milley and everybody else would agree that uh, uh, generals just don't have any business in the middle of politics. And can you clarify, um, you know, what are the ground rules for someone like him actually holding those kinds of conversations? Could the White House ever step in and say, hey, knock it off and stop participating in these kinds of publications? Well, you know, uh, the chairman, uh, as the saying goes, uh, serves at the uh, pleasure of the president. So uh, I am sure if uh, the president or a senior White House official told him uh, to knock it off with the backgrounders, uh, I am sure he would comply or risk uh, being uh, replaced because the president had had lost confidence in him. So uh, I don't. You probably know better than I how the White House views these books. I mean, they they seem to fit the uh, Democratic narrative that uh, that Donald Trump was up to no good in the uh, uh, second half of uh, 2020. Um, but I have not uh, heard anybody uh, say that uh, Milley's job is in jeopardy because of doing this. And we've heard uh, President Biden say, and both and Secretary of Defense Austin say, they both still have confidence in him. That's right. And even the White House press secretary has said they don't really have an issue with it. Uh, what they mm -hmm. may have an issue with, though, is the fact that a lot of, that McKenzie, General McKenzie, General Milley today, made clear that their opinions on how Afghanistan should have ended differed with the president, which contradicts some of his own public statements about alleged unanimity uh, among military yeah. commanders about what to do. I mean, that that is a is a clarifying moment today, and evidence that there was dissension with the president, disagreement, at least, about how things should wrap up in Afghanistan. There was disagreement. I, I, dissension and you've would reported be the wrong that. word. <clears throat> yeah. Dissension would be the wrong word, because they will, all will tell you they got a chance to make their case. And they would send him written uh, options papers, and, and he would send them back with questions uh, showing that he really had read those, those option papers. So, at the end of the day, he's the commander-in-chief, civilian control of the military, and he made the decision to pull out, even though the generals were telling him the consequences, and as the, the intelligence agencies were telling him the consequences, too, that if you pull out all troops, it is only a matter of time, and then the estimates 
uh, varied from a matter of just a few months to a year or more, but only a matter of time before the Afghan army disintegrates and the Afghan government collapses. So uh, the, the big surprise for everyone, including the, the generals who recommended uh, uh, keeping troops there, was that things would collapse so rapidly. Um, and, you know, it's now been ca uh, called the 11-day collapse. And think of that, a 300,000-man army collapsing in 11 days without really putting out a f up a fight. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it was a fascinating hearing, and I'm glad we were able to recap some of it with you. David Martin from the Pentagon, thank you so much. Sure.